What is the most underrated video game of all time? Which game has the greatest split between artistic excellence and number of copies sold? The games that I tend to see most commonly cited include Okami, Eternal Darkness, or one of many Shin Megami Tensei games. Truth be told, though, there are hundreds of sublime, underrated experiences that I could list alongside those games. But if I were to pick just one game, one that I would rank above all these other amazing experiences, it would be the Talos Principle. To those who have no knowledge of this game, imagine the puzzle solving of a legendary game like Portal combined with the philosophical depth of a game like Soma. That is what the Talos Principle is. It is a synthesis of those two games and their quality. And I mean that more literally than you might think. After all, the story of both the Talos Principle and Soma are predicated on the same idea, that human consciousness can be reproduced via technology. Though this notion is explored in many of the same ways in both games, there is one major difference separating the two. Soma explores all of the potentially bad effects of the replication of consciousness in robots, namely how it devalues human consciousness as something supposedly gifted to us by God, and of course, the cataclysms that tend to happen when humans play God. The Talos Principle, however, is the exact opposite. It provides a compelling argument that we should wholeheartedly pursue the creation and elevation of consciousness, be it through children or robots. Best of all, it doesn't lecture this truism to you. Instead, the combination of the game's puzzles with the philosophical messaging littered throughout enables the gamer to intuit that moral for themselves. The result is one of the most positive, optimistic stories I've ever encountered in any medium. One sorely needed in a world where the development of AI is advancing seemingly as fast as human pessimism. Naturally, because I hold the game in such high regard, I could only react with peak excitement but also peak skepticism when I heard that there would be a sequel. While I could envision a sequel with better puzzles, I could not envision how the Talos Principle 2 could raise the bar story-wise, not just in terms of its philosophical sophistication, but how it could be more positive or life-affirming. Plus, the first game's story ended so perfectly that I almost didn't want it to continue. So, what did the Talos Principle 2 do in order to justify its existence? It took that life-affirming message from the first game and tested its strength to see how well it holds up against the most thorough pessimistic arguments and the worst of life's tragedies. Having recently completed the Talos Principle 2, I can firmly say that this choice in narrative direction, combined with the upgraded level and puzzle design, produced an experience that surpassed the first Talos Principle in almost every conceivable way. By confronting the gamer and the story's characters with the darkest and most difficult aspects of life, the Talos Principle 2 shows not only how bright the light of consciousness can shine, but the power it can confer to any person that says yes to life, regardless of background or intelligence. With this in mind, it is such a shame that this game has sold only around 240,000 copies. Going by my definition of underrated that I mentioned before, I don't think there has ever been a greater divide between the quality of a game and the number of people playing it, which easily makes it a contender for the most underrated game of all time, or at least the most underrated of the last decade. Now I understand that it was released in 2023, which was a pretty stacked year for games, but still, I don't want the game to be forgotten as people work through their backlogs or I don't know, as they finish their seventh playthrough of Baldur's Gate 3. So today, I want to discuss how the Talos Principle 2 builds upon the brilliance of its predecessor. Before I do, I will quickly explain how story spoilers will factor into this analysis. For the first part of this video, I will be providing a spoiler-free synopsis of the Talos Principle 2. 
But in order to do that properly, I need to spoil the story of the first game. If you have never played the first Talos Principle and don't want to be spoiled, bookmark this video and come back to it when you're done. And make sure to check out my analysis video on the first game, which I will link in the description box below. Now, let's get started. Towards the end of the first game, you learn that the robot you are playing as is a part of a simulation created by humans. The purpose of this simulation was to birth a robot with human consciousness, a feat that could only be accomplished if two parameters were met. First, it would need to solve puzzles, for it is through games and playful behavior that consciousness is properly formed. Second, it would need to question the rules that govern the simulation, for if it didn't, the consciousness that would be birthed would be incapable of thinking for itself. As the robot moves through the simulation, it uncovers various data logs which explain why the simulation was created in the first place. Due to the effects of global warming, a virus was released from permafrost that spread throughout the globe. A group of humans built the simulation in the hopes that when humanity was gone, it would birth a consciousness capable of free thought and reason, and transfer that consciousness into a robot body. That mission succeeded, for the robot we played escapes the simulation, and upon entering the real world, immediately sets out to rebuild civilization. At the beginning of the Talos Principle 2, we awaken as a different robot inside a different simulation, albeit one that is very similar to the simulation from the first game. After completing all of the puzzles, you awaken to find a robot named Neith, who then begins to explain the who, what, where, when, and why of our current situation. After explaining all the events of the first game, she tells us what happened to the robot that left the original simulation. That robot, who gave herself the name Athena, used the tools left behind by the humans who created the simulation to build more conscious robots. Those robots then went on to create a city named New Jerusalem. This city would aim to do what the humans could not, live in perfect harmony with nature. In other words, they would extract the resources from the Earth that they would need in order to survive, but not so much that they end up extinct like the humans did. Furthermore, Athena declared that only a certain number of robots should be created, so that overpopulation would not drain the planet's finite resources. That number was 1,000, and the robot we play as happens to be the last robot that will ever be created. Fittingly, our name is 1K. Now that the final robot has been birthed, New Jerusalem has achieved what Athena referred to as the Goal, with a capital G. The perfect balance that Athena envisioned had been achieved, and now robots could live in eternal bliss. However, as we quickly find out, there are reasons to question this supposed utopia. First, though New Jerusalem looks and operates in a mostly paradisal way, there are signs of wear and tear. Lights are going out, elevators will randomly stop functioning, and the dome that is to shield New Jerusalem from the harsh environment hasn't been finished yet. Many of the denizens look to Athena as their founder and figurative god to fix these problems, but she apparently left New Jerusalem a long time ago and nobody knows why. But the primary thing that makes this piece questionable is what happens immediately after 1K's birth. While New Jerusalem celebrates the achieving of the goal, a purple projection or hologram named Prometheus shows up and tells the citizens that, quote, the flame has awoken, and that it summons those who are brave enough to answer the call. Soon after this, a group of researchers determined that Prometheus originated from a faraway island, one that contains a variety of megastructures. They collectively decide to venture there, and upon arriving, they discover puzzles, ones that are similar in structure to the ones found within the first game's simulation. 
Moreover, they encounter compelling evidence that suggests that these puzzles, and the megastructures that they unlock upon completion, are linked to the missing Athena. From this point on, you solve puzzles, collect data logs, and converse with your team in order to determine what Prometheus and the Flame are, as well as what happened to Athena. Now before I get into the game's central theme, it would be worthwhile recapping the Greek myth that Prometheus and his beloved Flame obviously originate from, for the story of the Talos Principle 2 is one long contention with that myth's underlying moral. In the time before humanity existed, there were two sets of powerful beings, gods and titans, both of whom were constantly warring with each other. Prometheus was a titan who turned against his kind and joined on the gods' side, although in turn he did doom his race to the underworld, and watched the god Zeus doom his brother Atlas to hold up the earth for eternity. But hey, if it weren't for Prometheus joining the gods, humanity wouldn't exist. So, all's well I guess? After gaining the power of the gods, Prometheus sculpted humanity from mud, making them in the likeness of the gods. The goddess Athena, impressed with Prometheus' design, breathed life into the sculpture, and thus humanity was born. When Zeus saw Prometheus' creation, he said that these humans shall exist to worship the gods and make sacrifices for them, and those sacrifices would in turn please the gods enough to help humanity survive life's trials and tribulations. Prometheus disagreed with Zeus's wishes for humanity, and instead wanted to give humans the ability to survive without the influence of the gods. And so, he stole fire from the great forge of Hephaestus, the god of blacksmithing. He brought this heavenly fire to the humans, which enabled them to evolve beyond servile mortals and build advanced civilizations and technology. Some people felt so empowered by the gifts that Prometheus brought them, that they began to think they too were gods. When Zeus realized what Prometheus had done, he sentenced Prometheus to be chained to a cliff for eternity, and to have a vulture feast on his liver. Worse yet, that liver would regenerate at the end of each day, and that vulture would return to start the cycle of torture again and again. Regarding the meaning of this myth, the flame Prometheus steals symbolizes two things. Aside from the pivotal importance that the discovery of fire had to human survival and evolution, it also symbolizes consciousness and the unique power it affords humans over the world and its species. What isn't as clear is who was in the wrong in this scenario. Was it Prometheus for gifting this power to a species who couldn't wield it properly, that it would inevitably corrupt and cause their ambitions to go unchecked? Or was it Zeus for wanting to keep humans servile? That is the central question that the Talos Principle 2 is trying to answer, or rather, a version of that question. Are the robots doomed to repeat humanity's mistakes if they go beyond the goal that Athena set for them, particularly if they seek the purple Prometheus's flame? Even if they are, should they still disobey the goal? When you're not solving puzzles, you will be uncovering data logs and engaging in philosophical debates with various characters, all of which center around trying to find an answer to this question. Now where most forms of media might try to take a definitive stance on a philosophical debate, the data logs and conversations are structured in such a way so that the gamer isn't coaxed into choosing one side over the other. Rather, they feature a variety of compelling and well-structured arguments from both sides of the debate. On top of this, the philosophical debates you can have over this issue enable you to choose from a variety of responses. It makes you think hard about what your personal stances are and how you can effectively argue in favor of them, if you even can. Seriously, the dialogue trees were unbelievably well done, on the level of games like Planescape Torment, Disco Elysium, and Fallout New Vegas. I would like to get into the nuance of that debate, but before I do, I will warn you that I cannot do so without spoiling some aspects of the game's story. If you wish to know nothing more before playing the Talos Principle 2, again, bookmark this video and come back when you're done. 
Let us restate the fundamental question that the Talos Principle 2 is trying to answer. Should the robots go beyond the goal set by Athena, the one that limits humanity's growth to ensure balance with nature? Or is the goal meant to be broken? Let's start with the pessimist side of that argument, who I think is best represented in the game by the character Pandora. She is appropriately named, for after Zeus chained Prometheus to a cliff, he created Pandora, the first woman in Greek mythology, all for the sole purpose of counteracting Prometheus's transgression. Upon her completion, Pandora opened a box that she owned, which contained all of life's evil and suffering. The contents of that box spread throughout the world in order to punish humanity for their ambition, their attempts to emulate the power of the gods. When you encounter Pandora in the game, she constantly warns us about the dangers of consciousness, that Prometheus' flame will corrupt us. Some of these arguments seem simple on the surface. For instance, a flame can provide light and warmth, but it can also burn. The truth of that argument, however, is expanded upon by those who share her view. A character like Yakut links humanity's consciousness-fueled ambition to their extinction, brought on by man-made global warming. Sure, our treatment of Earth's natural resources supported us for a time, but in the end, it wiped us out. If Athena's goal is meant to avoid this, shouldn't it be honored? But I think the most powerful argument that the game makes against human ambition is their tendency to not take responsibility for their mistakes. Now, when ambition is matched with imperfect consciousness, failure is inevitable. Unfortunately, for too large a number of people, the pain brought on by this failure is often so great that it makes people never want to try again. And understandably so. For instance, soon after Athena first awoke from the simulation, she and the other robots she created started development on a different city called New Alexandria. One of the project leads, a robot named Eustasis, made a miscalculation during the building process that led to the deaths of dozens of robots. He was never able to forgive himself for this disaster. That said, he did try to find peace through a belief in God. Though there were others, particularly Athena, who did not believe in God, she respected his belief, and I think I can understand why. When things go wrong, people who feel unable to shoulder the responsibility of fixing those problems turn to somebody that they deem capable. This is why so many people prayed for Athena's return when she left New Jerusalem. Because when things went wrong, they didn't take the responsibility of fixing those problems. Instead, they turned to God. Or in Athena's case, a God figure. Maybe this is why Zeus was so livid when Prometheus stole the flame. Because he knew humanity would act this way. That they would still turn to the gods when everything went wrong. Maybe this is why Athena created the goal, so the robots would never contend with this problem. But that's just one side of the argument. The other side suggests that despite the pain that comes with human ambition, to not evolve to greater heights is a disservice to the gift of consciousness, which this game frames as the most sublime thing in the cosmos. Moreover, it is impossible to not evolve, one character, named Lithrazir, whom we never meet but learn about through audio logs, makes the Dostoevskian argument that Athena's goal, the idea of a perfect, serene society, is the epitome of evil. And to seek it out is a, quote, vile, cowardly surrender to oblivion. Even if it could be achieved, he says the first thing a conscious being would do in that scenario is commit an act of violence, just so something interesting would happen. There is profound truth to this belief, but also horror, and not just the fact that terrible things are inevitable, but that humanity will still shun the responsibility of dealing with those terrible things. But who is to say that humanity could not overcome this fear of responsibility? As various documents throughout the game make plain, it was only in the years leading up to humanity's extinction that this lack of responsibility seemed to grow exponentially. 
Before that, there was a romance in the spreading of consciousness, and with it, civilization. People would look upon a dam, for instance, and see it for the miraculous feat of engineering it was. But when humanity began to enjoy the fruits of hundreds of years of labor, their resilience and persistence in the face of suffering began to fade, while the problems that always existed began to surmount. Instead of taking responsibility for their sloth brought about from prosperity, instead of finding solutions to the repercussions of problems like global warming, they developed what G.K. Chesterton referred to, a poisonous humility. Quoting a document directly from the game, For the old humility made a man doubtful about his efforts, which might make him work harder. But the new humility makes a man doubtful about his aims, which will make him stop working altogether. Some characters in the Talos Principle 2, and people in real life, believed that new humility would save us from extinction. But for other characters, and people like G.K. Chesterton, see that new humility as a false virtue. The proper solution would be to act as adults, accept our power, and act consciously and deliberately in shaping the world. That way, as the character Cornelius says, we can move beyond comfort in gods, which, oddly enough, was what Athena actually wanted all along. Eventually, we learn why Athena left New Jerusalem. She saw that the people of New Jerusalem were revering her like a literal god, for escaping the first simulation when no other test subject did, and for building their miraculous civilization. Unfortunately, a consequence of this reverence was the tendency for humans to rely on her than on themselves. So, she decided to leave. But before she did, she created the goal. Not because she thought it should be followed, but because she thought it should be disobeyed. If she had told the people of New Jerusalem that the goal was wrong, they would have slavishly obeyed her. Instead, she wanted them to question her wishes, and in turn, develop the strength, the will, to disobey her, and author their own fate. If one should succeed in doing this, then the true power of Prometheus's flame would be available to the victor. At the end of the game, we learn that during Athena's absence, she discovered the literal theory of everything, the secret formula that would enable mastery over all aspects of the universe. For all intents and purposes, the theory of everything was the purple Prometheus's flame. When we finally find Athena, this power becomes available to us. All we need to determine is whether or not we can trust humanity with this power, or if we should shut it down. The choice that is made is ultimately up to the player, to their faith, or lack thereof, in humanity. As for what choice I would make, well, I'll just say this. There's one aspect of Prometheus's story that is often forgotten. Prometheus did not remain chained to the cliff for eternity. Instead, Zeus's son, Heracles, freed him, but only because Zeus permitted he do so. Did Zeus do this out of mercy, or did he do it because eventually, as the Talos Principle 2 suggests, Zeus realized that he was wrong? Personally, I choose to believe the latter. There is so much more to the Talos Principle 2 that I could discuss. I didn't even get to the stuff with the Somnodrome which allows the robots to communicate with their unconscious mind. There is a lot of juicy stuff there, amongst a wealth of other things. If you would like to see a part two, help me out by hitting the like button, leaving a comment, and sharing this video around. Please help the Talos Principle 2 get the attention it deserves. Until next time, remember to stay safe and stay yellow.